Hello, good evening everyone and on behalf of Bangalore Literature Festival and Bangalore International Center, a warm welcome to World Lit. World Lit is the Bangalore Literature Festival's digital literary platform where we bring to you live stream sessions, video interviews and podcasts with leading international and Indian authors. World Lit was launched in June of this year and we've had some great conversations on this platform with the likes of Anthony Horowitz, Pico Ayer, Tracy Cavalier, Jonathan Drury, Deborah Mogach, Sophie Hanna, among others. It is exciting to watch this platform evolve and we hope to see many more stellar authors and conversations in the days to come. Today, we are delighted to bring, to bring you what promises to be a lovely conversation with Ramesh Gunasekara, and Salil Tripathi, two much-fated and celebrated authors. Their detailed bios will appear in the chat box, and please feel free to post any questions you may have in the Q&A box. Thank you, Romesh and Salil, for making time for this session. Over to you, Salil. Thank you so much, Lekha, and thank you again, and hello to everybody in Bangalore. It feels very weird to say that you are in Bangalore when you're not really in Bangalore. But uh, that's the world we are in. And it's always a pleasure to talk to Ramesh. We have met, known each other for close to th two and a half decades, three decades maybe, when we first met. Oh, Ramesh. don't make it sound so long and so ancient. <laughs> it was mid-90s. It was mid-90s when I think the re a reef had come out and you were in yep. Singapore. And I was a young reporter then and you were a young writer then. And um, we had a conversation about reef uh, in Singapore and you said some very interesting things that have stayed with me over the years. So I'm going to probably allude to some of those things. And Great. one of those was that, that the ultimate virtual reality is book. And as I look back, you know, and then we had a conversation again, I think in Lahore in 2015, um, uh, about Noontide Toll when that came out. Uh, that was also face to face. So we keep meeting in, in, in places that is neither your nor my birthplace, uh, and, the, and not in London, where, we live, where, where I lived for a long time, and you still yeah. are, and uh, yeah. we met in other places, and this is a virtual meeting or a real meeting, so it's entirely up to us to make it seem as <laughs> real as possible, is what I want to say at the outset. Um, we are all figments of someone's imagination. <laughs> absolutely, but just speaking of imagination, that was my first question, actually related to what you had said then, because that was when internet was still very new and people were still learning how to play games, you know, on, on all their Pac-Man and, and, and things like yeah, that yeah. and, and yeah. Tetris and all of that. And then you know, the card games, I, st I don't, I can't play a game, card game in real life. So I can't even say any of those on the internet. But said, having said that, you did say that then the ultimate virtual reality is a book. If you're sitting with a book, then you don't need these gadgets. And now you are in a lockdown situation. You are at home. People were saying, I'm going to max myself on Netflix and I'm going to see this and that. But if you have a good well-stocked library, I see one behind you, I, there's one behind me. You don't need anything else. Is that fair? I think that's fair. I think it is, it is the, um, it is, it's, it's not just uh, the ultimate virtual reality. In some ways, it is the reality because um, being human beings, we, we live with our thoughts, we live with words, we live with a certain mental processes, and that's what is plugged into books as well. Obviously, not everyone is into books. I'm very well aware of that. We are a minority in the world, actually, people who, who, who live in books or who like books, who love books, or, uh, and so on. But, but increasingly, m most of the world large parts of the world anyway, are involved in this um, negotiation with reality through the medium of words. Um, and particularly the written word, whether it's on a screen or any other form. Now, you know, and I say that, I, I'm sure I said this when we last met as well, but you know, it, it's still not everybody in the world because there's huge parts of the world, huge populations that are not yet literate, don't have the access to education and everything else. But increasingly, I suppose people are negotiating the world through words. And mm -hmm. the book, it seems to me, is this amazingly designed machine that 
contains this information in a way that in, is incredibly accessible. And it is the ultimate, you know, to me, it's what, uh, as long as we have language, it is what's going to survive. You know, all the other things do get obsolete. Um, whereas the book can, you know, a fragment of a book can survive 2000 years and it'd still be able to access it if you have language. Whereas just yesterday I discovered one of my old, old computers, which I had kept, you know, one of those big computers that dealt with Windows 98 or whatever. I thought I'd keep that just to look at Pac-Man or whatever. And I tried to switch it on and it wouldn't work. I opened it up and I re realized parts were corroding inside and it just won't work. And so the technology is time bound in a way that the book isn't. Right. In fact, uh, I, you know, I, I, was, I did my uh, uh, graduate work here in the US uh, many years ago. And we had a very good bookstore the, at, my, at my college, like all college bookstores tend to be really, really good. And at the back, there was a beautiful quote, and I was just digging it out right now as you were speaking, because it resonates with some of what you're saying. And this is Barbara Tuchman um, uh, writing about books. And this is what she said, and I think there's a lot of wisdom in it, that books are the carriers of civilization. Without books, history is silent, literature dumb, science is crippled, thought and speculation are at a standstill. Without books, the development of civilization would have been impossible. They're engines of change, as the poet said, windows of the world and lighthouse erected in the sea of time. They're companions, teachers, magicians, bankers of the treasure of mind. Books are humanity in print. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, uh, which, which is an ideal thing to have in, in, in a bookstore at the back. Which brings me to the wonderful book you've written, Sun, Sun Catcher. Um, uh, uh, Sunbeam is the name of the bird that Jay, or do you call him Jay or Jay? I call him Jay. Yeah. You do call him um, Jay. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's just it's just one of those names that other names are often shortened into. Right. Uh, right. Whatever they are, Jayantha, Jay, Jay Sundaram, whatever it is, often comes down to yeah, Jay. I remember him as a cricketer, not as a politician. But let's leave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And no, but speaking of um, Suncatcher, I think uh, to, to for. Those of you who may not have read it very briefly, the plot is about coming of age. It's about waiting, young boys waiting to become men and a nation waiting not to lose its innocence, but at the cusp of that period. And this is Sri Lanka when it was Ceylon and what yeah. is going to follow from that. Uh, critics have seen traces of Fitzgerald and, and uh, Ashby Curry. Uh, some critics have also looked at Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. It's about two people. It's about class. Uh, it's about the clash that might tear apart the country, but it's the different kind of a clash that actually is being talked about, uh, which is one of economic class. And you know, the one who has inherited money versus one who uh, is making money and is on the go and, and rising and still the whole, I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a short novel, about 300 pages, but it packs so much into it and it contains so much of Sri Lanka and you learn so much about the place without it being in your face. So first of all, congratulations. But um, I wanted to tell you, uh, uh, tell us a bit more about uh, what brought you to the novel and uh, how it came about. Okay. Um, uh, sounds like an easy question, but it's really the most difficult one to answer. Um, I missed a little bit of what you were saying because it, it got frozen a bit, but it doesn't matter. I think I got the gist of what you were saying. Um, so how did I, how did I come to write it? Uh, how did it arrive? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's an important novel for me as a writer, um, because in a way it's the novel that I've been kind of wanting to write or waiting to write or trying to write probably ever since I started writing imaginatively, uh, writing fiction or even poetry. Uh, even when I was like 15 or 16, when I started writing stuff, as I would say, um, I wanted to write about uh, the loss of friendship, really. That was, I think, what was at the heart of it. Um, the idea that something could be tremendously important at a point in your life, particularly in your young life, and particularly friendship, and it might disappear. And 
the ramifications of that. So that was, I think, really at the core of it. And I've said this elsewhere, it's partly because I did lose a very, my closest friend uh, in a very, very different way from <laughs> anything to do that I write about. Yeah, we won't, we, won't, we won't mention what happens in the novel. Yes, we please. won't say anything about any of that, but, but the idea of loss, the loss of friendship, I think, uh, was, was there. But um, I really didn't know how to, to, how to approach this, I suppose. Though so maybe, you know, in some uh, poems that I've written, certainly even in some books, I mean, people talk about, say, Reef being about a sense of loss. And maybe that comes from this desire that I always had. But I hadn't a way of, of uh, writing about that. And I wasn't going, you know, I was kind of leaving it on the back burner for ages. Um, and then like often happens for me anyway, one book leads in a sense to another in a kind of, I'm not sure whether it's a, <laughs> a kind of issue of physics or chemistry, <laughs> one of the two. Um, so when I finished writing Noontide Toll, the book you mentioned a moment ago, uh, which is, uh, for those of you who haven't come across it, it's a book uh, set in the immediate aftermath of the war in Sri Lanka. Uh, so it was, it's set in the sort of 2010, 11, 12, that sort of period. It was written then, uh, very much focused on the history of that moment. and. I kind of wanted to write almost in reaction to that, to go to a period before that long, long tragic war happened. So going back at least 30 years to a different world of Sri Lanka to see what it was like and also to see whether the future was somehow in there. So that took me to the idea of writing a book set in that period. And that made me think that this might be the moment to try and write about the sorts of things that I wanted to write about probably, you know, 40, 50 years ago even. Um, and then I kind of started writing a story about friendship uh, and the awakening of friendship, I guess. But as I set the story in a particular moment in time, and as I began to learn more about that moment, and partly negotiate my memory of that period, as well as what I was trying to learn about it, I realized that it was also a moment, could be a moment of political awakening. And so the politics and the friendship kind of merged together in this story. Um, and so that was the, the kind of timing for it. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's you know, obviously because it's a period that we can't go back to in physical terms. It's an imaginative journey as well. So we go back to that virtual reality to create this virtual reality. 1960, for in Ceylon, as it was known then, um, and the world that was there, and how yeah. it connects. No, that's, a, that's an important year, and just to give some not to simplify the plot because it's it's outwardly a very simple plot but there's a lot of richness in it but and correct me if i uh, make it too too simplistic uh, but it's it's two families basically it's the alvis family which has uh, landed property plantations coconut plantations and so on a brother and uh, the father and the cousin uh, very very wealthy and the mother who's seen floating around in a kaftan looking like cleopatra in a hollywood set sonia um, and uh, there is this other family, uh, and it's not rich and rich and poor. I mean, it's not a classic Bollywood type of a divide. I mean, the the other family is actually middle class and aspiration. Uh, labor ministry, I think here, the father is a bureaucrat in a government department uh, and a Trotskyite and loves to bet on horses. And the mother is with Radio Ceylon, which of course we growing up in India, listen to it every time for the Bollywood songs, which... Uh, we used to get on that Binaka Gitmala and all that, uh, and uh, and their son is Cairo. Uh, Cairo, not necessarily from Kairos, but Cairo from the Egyptian capital, because the father is an admirer of Nasser, the president of Egypt at that time. And Cairo is looking up to this um, son of um, the Alvises, Jay, um, and um, he wants to be like him. He wants to be him in a way. 
and there's a girl in the picture and then there is another young boy who's Tamil and that's like the three musketeers scenario, isn't it? All for one, one for all. Can you talk a little about that friendship because it's not only class but also ethnic divide you're trying to, but the, the beauty of the novel as I see it is that you allude to things but you don't make it in your face. The, the storm that is about to come, you know, the ripples that can be felt, you don't make it that, that, that obvious. If you can speak a little bit about that part of the well, book. I suppose it is, it is, I mean, it's, it's this uh, uh, boyhood friendship, I suppose. So the, the strong bond is between Jay and Cairo. It's, they're, they're the two friends. Um, but it is a friendship that I think many people would recognize. Um, not necessarily everyone has, but it's a friendship where there is an imbalance, perhaps, of maybe power, so it's partly a kind of mentoring friend, friendship. Uh, and Cairo is, is kind of, you know, it starts with almost adoration towards Jay as this figure who can do everything. And then recognizing that actually Cairo himself has a contribution to make to this friendship. There are things that Jay can't do. Uh, his empathy is with the natural world, you know, despite his wealth and everything else, he does have this streak of, I suppose... Sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity towards the natural. Mm. You, you has an empathy towards other people, I think. Um, and so that's where the two are. But as you say, you know, there's a third boy who joins them, but is kept on the periphery of this friendship. Uh, though we, Cairo doesn't always know, and suddenly sometimes it seems like Jay has a quite a close friendship which, with the other boy, which he kind of resents a little bit. Uh, but it is that idea of, I mean, none of them are kind of gangy sort of boys, but they kind of come together and they, they do see something to be gained by being together. But the question is, how together are they really? Uh, I suppose that's part of it. Um, and what goes on for Cairo is, I suppose, is his slow realization of how the world works mm. and how other people in the world navigate that world or use that world. And he begins to understand, I suppose, I think it probably is a phrase in the book, the price of the privilege that Jay has. And he begins to also understand a little bit about um, the politics of his father and the politics of the previous generations, I suppose. But it's a very slow understanding of that. Um, and it's something that he then probably has to carry on throughout his life, I guess. Yeah. But the friendship, yeah. but just one thing on the friendship part of it. I remember when I was talking to someone, when I was in India to launch the book before pre-COVID, as it were, at the end of last year. Uh, and I remember someone interviewing me and telling me, actually, yes, I, they can understand because everybody kind of either wants to have a friend like Jay or is a Jay to somebody else, as it were. Mm. And that's true. It's also not true because in a way there are lots of people who wouldn't want a friend like Jay because he's just a bit too overpowering, a bit too dominating and so on. But there is a sense in which all of us are that kind of figure or we have that kind of figure that we are approaching. Yeah. And the other part, we, we have not yet mentioned the fourth person, the, 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 Atanyan, the Atanyan equivalent, you know, Jerry here. Yeah. And uh, that, I mean, the way I read it is that you have three friends where there is an ethnic divide, of course, because one of the boys is Tamil, but there's also the class divide, which comes in in the way um, Jerry is treated. I mean, we don't want to go into what happens in the in-depth story, but it's interesting how they're, they're three and one for all, all for one, they do come together and there are times when they divide. And, and what I found very interesting throughout was that you do allude to class as a dividing line in the novel. And of course, Sri Lanka does get fractured later, but the, the, the jolt that goes through 
is not necessarily class, but it was something completely different language. You allude to it, of course. You talk about the Sinhala, uh, and mm -hmm. and so if you can tell tell us about a bit about the politics of 1964, because most of our viewers are probably in India. They know Bandar Naik as a name. They yeah. know that there is a Buddhist clergy, and there is this this uh, fervor towards socialism. Yeah. Yeah, I I guess it is. 1964 isn't. Uh, to be frank, isn't recognized generally as a kind of watershed moment. Uh, and if you had asked me, uh, well, last time we met, not the last time, but when we met about Nuntai To in Lahore, um, I would have said, well, you know, 1964, I wouldn't have remembered what was significant about it. Um, but uh, what I did remember was that it was politically somehow there was significance. And one one when I sort of decided to set the novel at that point in time, rather than 1965 or 63, or actually, you know, one possibility was setting it at a recognizable sort of change, which was 1972 when Sri Lanka became uh, a republic uh, and ditched the Ceylon name and so on. Uh, that would have been a possibility. Um, but as I kind of uh, researched the period, I realized that actually I remembered in a sense why it was significant and the significance, the year that the, the, the very strong left-wing movements in Sri Lanka, particularly the largest left-wing party of the time, uh, fractured, really. And what was really significant, of course, and it's significant in world politics as well, is that the Trotsky, this was a Trotskyite party, and the Trotskyites were elected members of parliament and joined the government, or a faction of them did. So they came into power on a, on a, on a, on a democratic road, as it were. But as a result of joining a coalition that party then fractured, and there was a lot of a, a big fallout for that whole movement as a result of it. And in a sense, left-wing politics changed completely from that year onwards. So that was the significance of it. But what struck me, what was really interesting when I was writing the book and thinking about this was how similar it was to, the, to our own era of mm -hmm the political shenanigans, the way power was being moved around, the way MPs would cross the floor, join from one party to another, um, the sense of crisis all around, uh, the sense that the government might fall, might win. Um, the, at the same time, there was a, as part of this process, there was a lot of hysteria about the media, there was an attempt to, in a sense, uh, clamp down on press freedom. Uh, the clergy, the Buddhist clergy was very, uh, very vibrant then and very political, flexing their muscles, if you like. Education was in chaos. Uh, schools were being closed down and so on. So there was, a, you know, in a, in a sense, the world that people inhabited was probably not unfamiliar to the one that we are in now. Right. Yeah. And so that was very interesting. But the main thing was this, the political change as to the, the paradigm, if you like, of politics changed that year. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, uh, taking a slight angle from what we've been talking, uh, but in a way it's related to what we are saying, that you lived in the UK since you were 17 or 18, something like that, yeah. am I right? Yeah. yeah. So you spent a large part of your life in Britain and it's Sri Lanka that you keep coming back to. And I recall from our early conversation that you also spent part of your childhood in Philippines and in the match, the book about cricket. Yeah. There's yeah. A famous expat versus the match between the Hong Kong and Manila expat, yeah. the match that you write about. Yeah. Sunny Fernando, I think is the name. And that, yeah. that, that's that, it. That's it. that, that young that's girl, really that woman, right? I mean, who, who bats brilliantly, the neighboring girl, or I, I'm yeah. just trying to remember now, yeah, yeah. Anyway. You've got a better memory than me for it. <laughs> cricket, I can't forget, <laughs> that, that's the problem. I'm a cricket, cricket tragic, yes, so. Well, there's um, a match going on right now as we speak, I, I guess. But it's not cricket, that's T20, that's Tamasha, that's not cricket. <laughs> so, 
I will ignore that. I will ignore that. Uh, but uh, no, but my question is that you keep coming back writing about Sri Lanka. Britain does feature, I mean, you know, in a sand glass, you know, it's told over yeah. a day and a half in London, the novel, and other characters do keep coming in and out of Britain. Even here, um, uh, the Tamil boy's uh, father is about to go for a year to Britain. So Britain does, yeah. but it's almost at the periphery, whereas it's very much part of your main life. Is that conscious? Is that a desire to write or understand more about your own past? What's driving that? It started out, I think, uh, well, it's, it's, it's partly conscious, uh, mm. but really, I suppose, um, well, let me do two or three things. I, I haven't always written only about Sri Lanka, but a lot of the books are, as you say. So uh, it's part of my journey, I guess. Um, and even one of the books that's not entirely set outside Sri Lanka, which is the book set in Mauritius, Prisoner of Paradise, has Sri Lankan characters in it as well. Um, and the reason, I guess, is, is partly because as a writer, I don't think one is entirely in control of what one does. Um, and in a way, it's a bit like, I don't know, I don't know, I suppose uh, Jay in Suncatcher would say it's a bit like fishing. Mm. You know, when you're fishing, you eventually go to where the fish are. Uh, there's no point trying to fish when there are no fish. As it were. And if you catch one fish, you probably tend to go back there to see whether you can catch another one. Um, mm. Or if you're, you know, I don't know, if you're mining for something, you hit a vein and you go there till the vein runs dry, as it were. Um, so I think basically you know when i was younger i was writing and i don't think i i don't know probably for 10 years i probably didn't write stories that had anything to do with sri lanka it just wasn't on my radar and then one day i wrote a story that had sri lankan characters and i suddenly felt that was different mm. um and that it worked in a different way and since then i think i would say it's mainly because it's characters that probably first draw me into a story. And um, the characters that I've come across, I've enjoyed their company. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of stayed with them. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, uh, the locations can change. Um, I don't know what I'm writing since the last book uh, will be following characters living in all sorts of other places. But uh, I mean, the link with Sri Lanka will probably still be there in a strong way. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's sort of slightly out of my control. At some point, it'll go in a different direction. Mm, right. Uh, you refer to fishing and which kind of ties in and gives me the segue to the next question that I had thought of. <laughs> Which is about the, the fact that wildlife and uh, birds and aviaries and reefs in the in, in reef itself, uh, the natural world plays a fairly important role. I mean, I've talked talk about two books here, but I mean, yeah. sure if I were to uh, uh, look at your work as a PhD student, I'll probably find many more references. So, and in a way, it's you're ahead of the curve. You know, writing about climate. You know, Amitabh Ghosh wrote that. Um, Great delusion a couple of years ago, a few years ago, where he talked about how the, the crisis that nobody's addressing from the world of fiction and writing and tends with the climate one. And um, you have take, not taken it head on, but you know, in an oblique way, because uh, you are that kind of a writer. Uh, you have been. So, does it, is it again a conscious thing or, or does a natural word speak to you? Well, I think it probably does speak to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I can answer, I can come at that in two ways, I suppose. In a way, if you take Suncatcher, there's quite a lot of me in both those boys in there, in that story. Um, and I, it was only after I wrote that book, I suppose, I realized just how lucky I have been in my past to have lived at a time when access to that natural world was somehow easier. Um, so even though I was a you know, town boy, if you like, I, you know, I'm from Colombo, I grew up there. I did spend a lot of time outside Colombo. I, you know, I was regularly out in that natural world, if you like. 
Um, and of course, Colombo in those days also was much more of a garden city, as it were. But um, so I have had that uh, access and that uh, appreciation of that world. Um, but the rest of it is also a kind of intuition, I guess. When I wrote Reef, I guess, um, I was writing, uh, you know, it turned out to be a book about a, mar a marine biologist, someone interested in reefs and so on. And certainly that wasn't something that was uh, written about or talked about much in the literary world, if you like, or any other world for that matter. Um, and I kind of, as it turned out, obviously, you know, that concern with the reef and the erosion of the reef and what we were doing to the reef and the damage it was causing was something that's there and it's palpable in the book itself. Um, and of course, it, you know, it, it turns out, you know, what well, that was in 1994. So, you know, 10 years later, there's a tsunami that has this terrible effect on, on Sri Lanka. And undoubtedly the effect is amplified by the fact that the reef had been so damaged in those coastal areas. It would have pro provided some protection and it didn't. Um, so I guess that was, I mean, you know, when you write a book, you are, tr you know, you are trying to distill what's going around in the world. Um, and I think, um, I, I didn't write that book thinking, oh, one day there might be some terrible thing that happens. But I just felt when I was writing the book, it was very clear to me that this is the world we live in. And the natural, the relationship between the human world and the natural world is one that is symbiotic, that we are in a sense feeding off each other. And we need to somehow look after that relationship. Which is why later on when I wrote uh, Heaven's Edge, I don't know if you've ever come across that study, but that's, uh, that's a futuristic sort of book um, set you know, in the future, but it's set in a, in a disastrous future, if you like, ecologically as, a, mm -hmm. as well as other things. And I think that now people occasionally look at that in terms of what's becoming known as eco-fiction, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a con I have always had that concern, that, but that comes out of the kind of childhood I had where I did have access and an appreciation, if you like, of the natural world. Um, and that's something, again, which I want to kind of celebrate. And it's not, I mean, I know, you know, we are living in a very, very difficult time and the climate change issues, I think, hugely, hugely important. The wildlife issues are hugely, hugely important. Um, and I think there are, you know, things we need to do. But I think, in a sense, in Suncatcher, Jay is trying to sound those warnings way back in the 60s. He's like a child who has just realized that somehow something's wrong with this world. He doesn't know what it is. But what's wrong, he can see in the natural world and what mm -hmm. is happening to that natural world. So he's, one of his big things is the idea that somehow the, the city he's living in is, is somehow damaging the environment, though he wouldn't put it quite in those terms. But if, he was, if, he was, if it was happening now, I think he would say, yes, things are really, really bad, but there are good signs as well. There is a much greater consciousness of what we're doing wrong. There's much greater effort to try and do something about it. Um, I know we've just had that, you know, Richard Attenborough talking about the numbers of species that are disappearing and so on. Um, but there are very, you know, there are small stories of things that are improving as well. Um, and where we can try and help uh, things happen. And I think in a way, understanding or having an appreciation of that natural world is the first step really um, so that so that we we do actually enter relationship with it somehow Even I, I imagine yeah no i mean i'm not deliberately trying to go back to our earlier conversations but there was something else you had said in the 90s which was 
very telling about the importance of islands uh, mm -hmm. as a person you're writing, uh, how writers from islands look at the universe differently. And later in Lahore, when we touched upon the same thing again, you'd say because islands are nice laboratories. You know, Philippines, bunch of 7,000 islands, something like that. Seven, yeah, I think 7,000 islands. Yeah. Uh, Sri Lanka itself is an island. England, where you live, is an island. The Mauritius novel I've not read, but that too is an island. So I just wanted to tease your thoughts on that a little bit. Well, I, 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 I think I, I have thought a little bit about that because it comes up every now and again. But yeah, I think it is, it, again, it's a metaphor, I guess. Yes. A, a really interesting metaphor for a lot of things. A bit like, you know, reef is an amazingly rich metaphor for the way we live, the way we relate to other things, the way the imagination and memory works. Uh, what's important in a reef is, you know, the sensitive top layer, but what's, what kind of gives it substance is its dead mass of skeletal reef sort of thing. In, in the same way, island, I, islands, I think, are interesting metaphor in the sense that uh, it is where you can see on a, on a micro level, if you like, things that have implications for the macro level. Uh, but it's also really interesting to me because of course, you know, The Perfect Island, again, is a book, mm -hmm. you know, between those covers, as it were, is an island that you enter. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it's Prospero's Island, if you like, that you mm -hmm. enter that magic realm into which you give yourself for, a couple of hours or a couple of days or maybe a lifetime if you really love the book uh, and that's where you live and that's where you thrive um, and that's where you begin to see how the world works so to me i think that's that's part of it so i think um, in a way that notion of island goes from uh, the individual if you like how we carry certain things for ourselves connected you know, maybe it's part of an archipelago, no man is an island, it's obviously true, no woman is an island, that's obviously true, but at the same time we are, we are entities, um, and it can grow into whether it's, whether it's a cultural island, whether it's a national island, whether it's a geographical one, whether it's the planet, um, or whether it's a book. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I mean, we are always alone in a crowd, and I mean, now there are no crowds. Especially. <laughs> <laughs> at least six feet apart, we have to be. But yes, so that's absolutely very well said. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about music. And the reason I wanted oh, yes. to ask was that you're writing about 1964 in this novel, which is, of course, you know, the Beatles are everywhere at that time. And you allude to their song, you know, the boy is on a cycle and singing, I want to hold your hand while, while going down. And I think um, uh, Clarence, isn't it, who tells... Uh, Cairo, that uh, the Beatles have now made a film, obviously reference to Hard Day's Night. Uh, so the Beatles clearly play, uh, and there are, I think there are a couple of other m motives. I think you referred to an Audrey Hepburn song of Huckleberry yeah. and in yeah. Yeah. particular. Yeah. So I just wanted to know, I mean, uh, to what extent it was um, uh, an in joke for yourself, kind of recognizing what you, what matters to you. Where do you want to bring the music in? Where does it amplify? Where, where does it enhance the mood? How, what role does it play? What did it play in this novel? And the ones in the past, which I've not read as closely because I've read them some time ago. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You know I did, someone did ask me to, to do, a, do a sort of um, Spotify list to go with this book because there are some references to music. Um, um, uh, the Beatles obviously are there, but um, I think the one I was thinking of when I was writing the book, when I came up with the idea of the title Suncatcher was uh, the song that Jerry and the Pacemaker had hit of a hit called Don't Let the Sun Catch You Crying, which is a bit of a mournful, sad song, but uh, uh, it gets a mention somewhere in there, but it's there like as a sort of background, background song as well, which was a hit at the time. Um, and I, was, I thought about that, and there are, as you say, the uh, Moon River is mentioned in there, uh, Jim Reeves is mentioned. Jim Reeves, for some peculiar reason, was the most popular singer in Sri Lanka, in Ceylon of that era, possibly of any era in Sri, in, in Sri Lanka, for reasons I can't quite work out. But anyway, there are there is a kind of soundtrack there. But it made me think about um, 
music and, and writing. Um, these days, I know lots of young, not only these days, but for, for a few years or maybe a decade or two, uh, writers have used popular music as a kind of uh, sign, as, as a shorthand for atmosphere. Personally, I don't think that works um, because, and you know, when I, when I run master classes and things like that, I do often tell people, actually, you know, it's great you have this, this uh, track, as it were, mentioned, but I don't know it, so it doesn't do anything for me. Mm. And so, you know, these cultural signifiers have to be really, really universal, mm. or they have to have some very, very uh, smaller effects, if you like. Mm. Um, so, I, you know, something like the Beatles is fairly universal, but even that, you know, every, every, every cultural thing is, in, is hanging on there by their fingertips all the time, you know. Any moment they can disappear out of consciousness and, you know, the younger people will say, well, you know, it wouldn't mean anything to them. So I try to, if I, if I have music coming into a story, I try to use it uh, where either the words themselves have a meaning that is relevant, or there's something else that's sort of it fits in with that makes it relevant. Otherwise, it's a sort of private joke, I guess, or a private reference, which some people get. So, I mean, the, an example of a more private reference is in Reef, for example, uh, there is a soundtrack in my mind, uh, because that's largely set in 1970, I think, um, 70, 71, that sort of period. 69, 70, 71, I think, that mm -hmm. sort of period. Um, you know, soon after the summer of love in, in, in the US, as it were, which was having its ripple effects around the world. Um, and so that's meant, it's there. People may not notice it in Reef, but um, it's there. And there's a moment where, um, for example, the narrator there, Triton, talks, is overhearing something and he, he makes a gesture or something. Um, and there's a phrase there, which is an entirely private joke for me, which is where he says something like kiss the sky. Kiss the sky is a phrase that comes out of Jimi Hendrix, uh, mm. Purple Haze song, if you know it at all, um, which Triton would have no connection with at all. But in terms of his emotional feel, that would have been the feeling there. So I think it's just using, 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 um, songs or phrases for whatever reason. For my case, mostly it will be for the musicality of the words of a title or something like that. Uh, and for just, just a tiny little tinkle. Yeah, no, no, that's very, very useful and very important. And, and you use sounds also, right? I mean, there's a phrase that I picked up from, I think it's in from Sandglass, where you say, what the scale upon scale of grandeur that sometimes can go wrong in the grandeur of heaven. Um, and the line you had was, what they really need to do is imagine a stilled heart and the peace that can only come from the absence of conflict, of abrasion, of sound itself. So the whole relationship between sounds on one hand and silence on the other, which was a very personal, I suppose, question is that when you sit down to write in the, in the lockdown period or even otherwise, uh, in a way, it doesn't say. Do you have something playing at the back when you write? Do you like listening to it? No, no. I I, not at all. And uh, again, I think I wrote about this in that piece about, <clears throat> about um, it's for a website called Large Hearted Boy, I think, um, on, on music and writing. And uh, I mean, all these things all change, I guess. Um, when I was young, I think, mean, when I was a 17 year old or 16 year old writing, then music was there all the time. Um, whether it was, uh, you know, whatever I was listening. And I used to, you know, love all the singer-songwriters um, all over the world, but a lot of American writers, I suppose. Um, and, you know, they would be playing in the background. Um, and, the, and my writing was really, really bad. <laughs> um, and I think when I started writing a bit more seriously and wanting to get 
uh, shape my own thoughts and words and try and make something out of it, then I realized I needed silence. Um, mm-hmm. Or I need, needed the absence of music or the absence of uh, certainly lyrics, I think. The idea of somebody else's, in a sense, something that's close, close to what I was doing. I didn't, I didn't need actually. And music is very, very powerful. I think it's an incredibly powerful art form and it does control you hugely. And that I want to be free of when I'm writing. So even now when I'm writing, I, I don't have music. I don't mind if there's a, and as there quite often is a, you know, a hammer drill going on outside on the road, I can handle that. Uh, but I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to handle uh, uh, particularly a really good song. Um, mm. The only only variation on that would be maybe when I'm uh, kind of, not even editing, but really putting putting a manuscript together, doing the more administrative parts of, of writing, you know, working out the layout or something. Then I don't mind having music, but I would want that music to be one that is really um, less intelligible to me. So music in a different language mm-hmm. is okay. Um, or, you know, something very classical and architectural, like Bach or someone like that. Yeah. I was, just, I was going to ask about Bach, but there you said it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sheer mathematics of it, you know, and, and, and that... Really yeah, and also, I, I, I mean, it's also because a friend of mine who know quite well, used to talk, a musician has talked to me about Bach so much that it's there in my head as well, but, um, you know, there's a, there's the mathematical part of it, but even his actual scores are graphically quite interesting. You know, they're like writing. It's a very interesting shape and form. Um, but also, you know, funnily enough, actually growing up in the 70s, uh, late 60s, 70s, Bach was also very popular among the alternative lifestyle as a thing, as yes. somehow it was, it was the architectural part of it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm not sure, but it may. It wasn't it around the same time that that cult book was written, Godel Escher Bach, which goes into the mathematics, the philosophy, and music. In the oh same yes, time. yes. It may be around the same time because a lot of us were reading around in the late seventies, I think. I'm, I'm not sure. I can check up, but uh, this is not the time to do that. We have about twelve minutes, I believe, because we do have oh, a hard stop. Oh. I'm told. And I've already seen three questions. So why don't we take those first? I do have some more questions, but I think I've spoken enough. So yeah, let's do that. Okay. Amar Kumar, and his question is that the language in the book is beautiful. Is the prose the result of careful crafting or is this how the first draft gets written? I mean, how, how often do you revise? Yeah. Oh, I wish it was the first draft. <laughs> um, no, I revise. Uh, a huge, huge amount. Um, sometimes uh, if I'm teaching a class, I occasionally show a photograph of, of the pile of manuscript papers for one book. And they usually at least pile up to at least half my height. Um, so every book tends to have uh, many, 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 many versions. But sometimes, you know, the right sentence does come out and survives all those revisions mm-hmm. um, and you know there's a lot of luck in this as well um, some books takes take years and years to write because I keep going over and over and changing every single sentence um, other books noontide tour for example was very very quickly written um, but in a sense it was easier because it was a one voice telling the story and uh, it was just becoming that person but um yes i think for you know the difficult thing about writing is that it takes an awful lot of effort to make it seem effortless and um and it needs to be seen that way but that's part of part of the magic you're trying to conjure up i guess um but um yeah it's also you know 
in this book particularly, um, slightly linking that to the music thing, in a, in a sense, I was also quite conscious that I wanted this almost to work as a piece of music. So um, the words had to, had to be like notes. They had, to, they had to be in the right place mm -hmm. to make a certain, almost to make a sort of sound. And I don't know, you know, I don't expect any reader to read it in this way, but if one was reading it very carefully, you would notice certain phrases reappearing or certain images reappearing. But to me, that is the same way as a phrase in a symphony would reappear um, to create a certain sort of music. Um, and I'd almost forgotten that when I'd finished writing it, but uh, it was only uh, a few months ago, I did the uh, narration for the audiobook. So I, you know, this is the only book that I've actually said aloud every single syllable in it. Uh, and in a very short period of time, as it over two or three days. And, and so um, that reminded me again that it does, that I did want it to work as almost like a piece of music. Uh, but yeah, it takes, takes to me, for me, it takes quite a lot of refining to get the words in the right order. Right. Uh, there's a question from Nandita Bose here, uh, thanking you for an amazing book. Uh, she's curious, do you identify as a subcontinental writer? Do readers in Sri Lanka and the neighboring countries respond more authentically to your work? Well, how is the reception in Britain among the non-South Asian audiences, for example, when you speak uh, as against being in, uh, at a festival in, in Gaul or Jaipur or, some, or in Bangalore for that matter? Um, it's, a, it's a difficult one to answer. I mean, I think, I think it does... Uh, Different people will respond to different aspects of it. Um, I think uh, uh, I you know I think readers in in India or in Sri Lanka, neighboring countries, have a certain relationship with that material because because of it's a bit like the music. If you know the music, if you know if you've heard the music that's been referred to you will have a certain sort of response. If you've never heard that music, you have to have a different response. And in a way, my kind of, uh, the way I want to write is, I want to make each sentence, as well as the whole book, meaningful to someone to whom the material is familiar. Mm -hmm. um, say the image is familiar. In which case they they need I want them to have the pleasure of that recognition, mm. but if it's not familiar, I want them to have an equal pleasure, but it'll be a pleasure of discovery um, and to do both isn't easy, I don't think, um, but that's what I strive to achieve really mm. and that's very well put the recognition and the discovery which are which is what we are after that you know trying to get in a way that's what we all that's what we look for in a book actually if it's all familiar we, we're not interested if it's yeah. all unfamiliar we're not interested but we want to feel that it is and it takes me really right back to the beginning your virtual reality question you know what is this amazing thing that we like in fiction and i think what we like is the fact that it's both real and not real and that's what's so amazing when we you know when we kind of love a book and we we go to where the book is set you know the way people go to i don't know they go to uh, dublin because they love um, either the dubliners or ulysses and they will follow Leopold Bloom's footsteps, even though they know Leopold Bloom is an imaginary character, he didn't have footsteps, yeah. but they would follow. Uh, or you go to Jane Austen's bath and you, will, you can go on a trail as it were, and people do and they get a kind of pleasure, even though they know it's not a real character that they're following. Um, and I, I, I think it's just the way it rubs up against reality, it's something that I think as readers we love. Yeah, yeah. Um, Adisha Shankar has a question which is about memory. That is memory within a narrative, a reliable tool, which kind of 
that, I mean, you allude to some of that in your, in your previous answer, especially if you have an unreliable narrator. And I want to again go back to our old conversation where you had once told me that you journalists have it harder than fiction writers. Uh, the reason being that uh, you can make stuff up and journalists cannot. Now, there are lots of people who, who are of the view that journalists only create fake news who will probably disagree with that in the current time. That, the credibility that some journalists have, particularly on, particularly on television in India. I mean, you know, they do make up a lot of interesting things. And, uh, but that said, I mean, that was an editorial comment, probably not necessary here. But, but the question remains that the reliability of the narrator, how crucial is it in fiction? Well, that, I think there's sort of two, two areas there. One is um, the reliability of fiction and its sort of truth telling qualities. And I think there we go back to our earlier conversation. And yes, so in journalism, you're meant to tell the truth, uh, but you often end up telling a kind of lie because it might be a partial truth. And in fiction, you're in a sense setting out to tell lies. You're creating something that's not true, but in the process, hopefully getting at some truth about the way we live or the way we are or what we what's important or something like that. Um, so there's, I think a reliability in fiction is, we know when we read a book that is meaningful because that is not meaningful, that's pure entertainment. It's just for the moment to pass the time. That's, that's a different kind of fiction uh, and legitimate fiction as well. Um, but then there's the other side of that question, which is the unreliable, narrator and how you deal with it. There, I think that's kind of a technical sort of question, um, whether the unreliability of the narrative is part of the story and part of the pleasure of the story, or is the unreliability of the narrator simply because of the weakness of the writing, that they, somebody just hasn't taken close enough attention to, to, to things. So in my mind, the the way I would answer that is to say that um, in a book, if, in, a, in a novel, in, in a novel, I think you're trying to create a world that your reader can believe in. And therefore, even if it's a fantastical world, it has to have a logic to it that makes sense. So within that, you can't have unreliability. It has to, you know, if things have to follow their own laws that are true to that world in that novel, um, so unreliability then is simply a way of somehow telling your story uh, and a way of giving other glimpses of it. That's okay. But there's a deeper question there, which is to do with how you use memory and how reliable that is. And that is quite important for this book, Some Catches, set in the 60s. The 60s that I remember, and I have direct access to, but how reliable is my memory? My memory isn't great. I think it's not a very good memory, but I also realize it's actually better than a lot of other people's <laughs> memory. Um, so I don't quite know how to judge it. And with this book, there are really practical issues. I would, there were things that I wanted to know what it looked like or what happened. And I can remember certain things and I wanted corroboration to that. And it was impossible to find because the people who could corroborate are no longer with me, as it were. They've passed on. Um, and so I've had to either make it up or make it make sense within the book. Well, my great takeaway, I know we are on the hour now, but my great takeaway from what you said is the size of your manuscripts you were talking about, how much it is, and how you squeeze that into short books, but who are so, which are so engrossing and profound. So thank you for all your writing and uh, look forward to more conversations and therefore more books is, is what I would, I would, I would. Definitely. Add that, yeah. Thank you so much, Sally. It's been a pleasure to talk to you again. We should do it a bit more frequently. Than yes, this I think one. we should. Yes. And in the real world, I hope sooner rather than later, but Raghu, I turn, turn it over to you, Raghu now, or Lekha, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh and Salil, for what I think can be described as a pleasant ride through a convergence of memory, history, politics, nostalgia, music, and the keen craft of Ramesh's writing in a way that only Salil could have done. Uh, 
Uh, thank you both. And uh, thank you to all those who tuned in. Have a lovely day, both of you on the other side of the world. And good night, everyone else. Thank you.